Before we get to all the piratey fun of today's episode, I'd like to talk about all the hellish fun that is Dread Templar, the brutal new first-person shooter from Fulcrum Publishing, which just slashed its way onto Steam, GOG, and the Epic Game Store. To achieve your quest for vengeance, you'll need to use 10 brutal death-dealing instruments, 100-plus skill and weapon upgrades, and an arsenal of arcane dread powers that'll annihilate the legions of the undead throughout 25 sprawling and handcrafted levels. Dread Templar combines old-school Twitch FPS gameplay with modern flourishes like air dashing bullet time and letting you build your moveset to suit your style, all to a pounding metal soundtrack that'll be sure to get your blood boiling. Hit up the link in the description below so you too can become the scariest thing in hell. Thanks again to Fulcrum for sponsoring today's episode, and without further ado, let's start the show. Welcome back to another swashbuckling, rum-chuggling episode of What Happened, the show that regularly extends its spyglass to peer in on video games and movies that had to navigate through particularly rough waters. Captain! Yeah, yeah? No, 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 no! It's been more than a hot minute since we've run aground on the shores of Cancellation Island, where creative projects go when they're no longer fit for this mortal coil, and it just so happens that the Vancouver-based Propaganda Games were responsible for more than one such sorry soul. When we last left this team, they had just shipped the divisive but commercially successful 2008 reboot of Turok, motivating the studio's owner, Disney Interactive Studios, to go all in. They had propaganda light cycle their way through the neon lights of Tron, hop on a dinosaur for an awesome sounding Turok sequel, and finally set sail for their biggest and most ambitious quest to date, and our subject today. So mateys, allow me to answer the question, what happened to the Pirates of the Caribbean Armada of the Damned? I got a You're all familiar with the Pirates franchise, right? The one that ran out of steam during the opening seconds of the third entry, but then they somehow released two more I'm not sure I've ever even heard of? Wait, what came out in 2017? Anyway, this Jack Sparrow delivery service was an absolute juggernaut in the mid-2000s. So much so, it dug up a shiny chest full of video game adaptations that were spread across several platforms and genres but they all had a very similar, uh, licensed game feel. So, Propaganda Games and Disney wanted to change people's perception of what a Pirates game could be, with a big-budget open-world action RPG that would hopefully stand tall as more than just a movie game. By diving into the unexplored depths of the universe, and to do so with as much passion, time, and money as they could realistically afford. One of the ways they chose to differentiate themselves from the prior Jack Sparrow-centric games was to distance themselves from Jack Sparrow, as well as directly lifting any storylines or other characters from the films. They would achieve this by setting the game years before the events of the first film, Curse of the Black Pearl. How is this game related to the other part films and games? Uh, actually, it takes place before the first movie, so it's strictly just based off of the property alone. Which, lukewarm take incoming, was far and away the best entry in the series. Armada of the Dam would thus not feature Sparrow, and would have to pen in their own unique protagonist who could stand on their own. And their name? Captain Sterling, you see. Ah, fine pirate name indeed. The events of the game would have seen this rookie captain perish at the outset, and returning to life via ocean-based supernatural gobbledygook, whereupon he would set sail once more to become either a legendary pirate paragon or a dreaded ghost of the seas, through various choices, encounters, and relationships along the way. If any of this sounds similar to, say, oh, I don't know, Mass Effect, that's because it was. Propaganda's VP and general manager, Dan Tudge, was overseeing the Pirates project directly, and had previously been co-director of Dragon Age Origins down at BioWare Edmonton. 
this boded well because the action RPG mold Bioware had helped popularize was all the rage when Armada of the Dam was first revealed in May of 2009, so the idea of swapping out planets, space stations, and science with islands, outposts, and the supernatural seemed like a fun extension of the formula. The reveal already had fans buzzing about Armada's potential, a vast expanse of the Caribbean to plunder and explore years ahead of similar journeys Ubisoft would eventually embark on their own. But as we'll see, propaganda's promising pirate party barge was going to have to batten the hatches to survive the choppy waters ahead. I was very fortunate to speak with Chris Barrasso, who served on this pirate ship as a senior concept artist and later as an associate art director, and who was open to discussing his experiences working on Armada for today's episode. Looking back at its four plus year long development, he felt it had some structural issues well ahead of its reveal. I think we lost a lot of time early in development due to an unclear vision for the game. There was a great deal of internal reticence to commit to a design direction for fear of excluding a set of features or mechanics that someone, somewhere at Disney, might really want. Despite robust ship combat, melee combat, quests, loot, and a decent story, the game suffered from a lack of mechanical identity, and too many cycles were wasted in pursuit of things that ultimately did not find a home on the project. I think the team would have benefited from stronger, more decisive leadership in the formative stages of the project. According to Chris, while propaganda was trying to suss out this early design phase, Disney management actually did stay out of their way and let them cook, for the first few years at least. He remembers that this slowly changed over time, and even though the project was greenlit with a desire from Disney to steer away from the stories told in the films, eventually all original ideas were failing to gain traction, so that same leadership wanted them to steer back around to the familiar pirate's trappings. Chris also explained that there were some unrealistic expectations about what the team could realistically accomplish. There seemed to be an ephemeral expectation that we could produce a massive AAA game more quickly and less expensively than anyone had done before. For example, I was given a matter of weeks to design the main character, his backstory, and the variant versions of him that the player could upgrade into. I produced facial studies, costume exploration, upgrade tracks, and wrote slash illustrated slash directed two short animatics that explored the character's origins. I was proud of the work, but there was a heated meeting with internal studio management whose intense but vaguely articulated frustrations just boiled down to the unfinished character not looking as good as Drake's fortune. Fortunately, these growing pains lessened as time went on, and once the project had started to gear up, they made big strides across every area of the game. So when it was ready to finally show at E3 2009, reception from game critics was very positive, with Games Radar exclaiming, The game has spectacularly preserved the spirit of the films, and they've done it without parasitically clinging to the moments you've already seen on the big screen. Game Informer also gushed by saying, We didn't go into our meeting for pirates with great expectations, but came out pleasantly amazed at the potential of the game. Chris said to me that there was concern that nailing an open world at a certain level of graphical fidelity would be a real challenge. The game featured all sorts of ocean and ocean adjacent environments, chock full of the flora and fauna you'd expect. Consoles at the time had very limited memory to work with, and getting all those assets to stream in as necessary can be a nightmarish ordeal. Thankfully, the team were up to the challenge. In Chris's words, the technical talent at Propaganda was remarkable, so I never felt like we were in a position where we couldn't execute. Indeed, despite some early choppy performance, visually the game was quite the looker, with the waves realistically bouncing and heaving, among other things. So it's no surprise that journalists and fans alike were impressed with what Propaganda were showing, as they were aiming for this to be an absolute stunner on every platform. And given that licensed games typically tended to, uh... not stun on any platform, it made Armada stand out all the more. 
In addition to the graphics, it would have also allowed players to have been able to engage in full naval combat with various armaments, board enemy ships, explore islands, and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemies in combo-based fisticuffs, complete with special moves, finishers, and even pirate curses you could cast on your foes. You would have also been able to customize your sterling visually with different sets of clothing and accessories, which would have been further altered by both the legendary and dreaded moral pass players could choose. Once you make that decision, you basically evolve visually and also uh, through your combat moves. On the marketing side, things were also seeming like they would line up quite nicely for the game. Chris told me that he felt it could have been completed in 10 more months, though he cautions even that could have been optimistic. Given that the game was cancelled in mid-October of 2010, it would have meant that it could have launched sometime around August 2011, only a few months behind the fourth film, whose name I cannot and refuse to remember. Chris did not indicate to me one way or another that there was any real pressure for Armada to release around the new film, which in my opinion might have been due to the fact that the idea of the licensed game was starting to change. The industry was seeing success with licensed games that were not direct adaptations of the source material, with the Arkham games being the prime example. Communicating to fans that actual time and care were being put into these existing IPs, rather than assuring them they were going to be available on store shelves day and day, seemed like the better choice, and the games were generally better off for it. This is one of the reasons why I think it's all the more unfortunate that Armada of the Dam would never manage this voyage to retail. While Disney were given the team at Propaganda the time and money they needed to make a compelling, polished experience, big sweeping decisions were being mulled at the publisher in 2010. The House of Mouse had been taking a step back to look at how their video game division was performing, and uh, it wasn't good. While Turok and even the first Spectrobes game had performed solidly, other releases under the Disney umbrella like Split Second and Epic Mickey lagged behind their even loftier projections. Disney Interactive had been running at a steep deficit since the very beginning, and while the 2010 fiscal year was an improvement from 2009, they would still wind up reporting an operating loss of 234 million US dollars by the end of that year. Now, while 2013's Disney Infinity was internally poised to be their big financial home run, that was still a ways off, so it was decided they would need to scale back and reorganize their gaming efforts immediately. Owning and financing several dedicated AAA studios to produce expensive multi-platform console games was deemed too expensive, ushering in the easiest part of the top-level bureaucrat's job, the cuts. While I wasn't able to cut everyone I wanted to, I have cut a lot of you. Propaganda had several teams working on multiple projects in addition to Armada, including the sequel to 2008's Turok and Tron Evolution. But out of all of them, Tron was the closest to the finish line, so it obviously made sense to keep that on schedule. Turok was still only just out of the concept phase, and as mentioned before, Chris estimated that wrapping up Armada could have taken 10 more months of development. So while the game was playable, good looking, and fun, it was still a long way off, and Disney apparently felt that even if it had been released, it wouldn't have recouped its marketing costs or financing propaganda for almost another full year. So, instead of getting his revenge on those that wronged him, James Sterling had a date with the unfeeling rope of the gallows. First time. The news then came in October of 2010 that Disney was cancelling Armada of the Damned, after it only existing in the public eye for a little over a year. Shortly thereafter, Tron Evolution would launch to largely middling and negative reviews, which prefaced its eventual bombing at retail. Then, just a few months later, Disney announced they would be shutting down the studio producing all these games. Originally, Propaganda was scheduled to stay open long enough for the Tron team to deliver an undisclosed amount of DLC content, but when the non-existent sales numbers for the full game came in, those DLC plans were also deleted. 
The mass layoffs then began at Propaganda later on in 2010, which kicked off a long list of closures under Disney Interactive, including split-second developer BlackRock Studios and Epic Mickey developer Junction Point, among others. Many fans and websites expressed disappointment with Disney's decision, as Armada was far enough along that many had been anticipating it. The game had been playable at E3 2010, just a few months before word of cancellation came down from on high. Frankly speaking, the gaming industry is chock full with cancelled projects, but it's very rare for a game of this size, scope, and quality to not reach the finish line. Part of Disney Interactive's reorganization would be to gather up all their IPs, pirates included, and fold them into the freemium, previously discussed, Toys to Life market with Disney Infinity, a very successful move that lasted for a few more years until they screwed that all up with Infinity 3.0, which you can learn about in this video here. This then all culminated in the entirety of Disney Interactive Studios being completely dissolved in 2016, which I think everyone saw coming. Chris Barassa lamented Armada's cancellation when I asked him how he felt about the decision. I'd have loved the game to be released. It was a lot of hours and work over four years to end up on a server somewhere. We pioneered the on-deck ship camera, this was well before the Assassin's Creed pirate game, and a solid combat system and great visuals for the time. Though the staff at Propaganda Games were handed a raw deal, fortunately many of them landed on their feet, including Chris himself, as he would go on to co-found Red Hook Games and directed both entries in the Darkest Dungeon series. So yeah, safe to say, he's doing fine. He also cites his work on Pirates of the Caribbean as incredibly important for his career, sharing with me that it was an exhilarating development. I felt supported by my art director and studio art director. I learned a great deal and the team had an exceptional level of talent. I'm still friends with many people from Propaganda and I'm grateful for the connections I made. I grew a great deal as an artist. So while Armada's story is, you know, not an outstandingly happy one, I will say in terms of pirate games, it's maybe not the most damned of the bunch. Thanks again so much to Chris for answering all of my questions. And if you out there in the vast scallywag filled ocean known as the internet would like me to hunt down further tales from the entertainment industry, do let me know in the comments below or step aboard the leaky ship that is my Twitter. I'll see you next time, mateys, and thank you for watching.